always tell people that I know and I, I've talked about earlier that there was always something different about you, that you always had something deep down that knew what your dad was doing was wrong. You always tried to fight it. Even though you never went to school, you were never exposed to the outside world. How did you know? I just always did. I always knew it was wrong. And I always knew that this was not the life I was meant to live or, or any of us. And that there was something out there like I, I didn't have to live a life of constant fear and pain and praying every day like my my prayer each morning when I woke up was that I wouldn't get beat that day or that he wouldn't touch me and that that's not a life to, to live and that, that's not I knew that that wasn't normal that that's not that all that was out there your dad thought he was God told you he was God but you knew deep down that God wouldn't beat you God wouldn't molest you God wouldn't starve you uh all of the torturous abuse he put you through you somehow knew that that wasn't God I knew that that was not the the life that God had chosen for me or also my family and I knew that God would not support a person who is doing all all the bad things you know that, that he was doing to us and so even though he used God for everything that he did to us I always knew that that was not what God's um, existence or presence was for from knowing you guys, he was worse than people can even believe. And it's impossible to believe someone could be that evil, but this is the one time where I believe he's worse than people think. I have to sit there and think that actually happened to me. Like, and sometimes I can't even believe it. So I can imagine how other people are not even going to know like the type of person he was. Like his every second, his every, every day of his life, it's like he focused and had a plan to manipulate, to, to um, just tear us apart and to break us down for his own, own needs and his own wants. And it's actually really disgusting. Let me ask you some of these questions that people always want to know associated with your case. And the first one yeah. is, why didn't you run away? Because it's, it's taught in you that you can't leave, there's nowhere you can go. And also, even if you turn to a higher power, he's already taken that higher power and said, it's him. So everywhere you go and you turn, there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to hide, there's no support. How are you gonna walk? It takes the ultimate amount of strength to just walk out to a person that you are the most fearful of. He made sure that we feared him more than, more than God. We feared the very sight of him would make us like quake in fear. So if you're afraid, how are you going to stand up for yourself or walk out, especially to a person who has oppressed you your entire life since you were born? I still don't know how I mustered up the strength to just walk out with literally nothing. I had nowhere to go. I had no money. I knew nobody. I slept in a hotel one night. I was homeless for months. Like, I still don't know how how I did it. There, there are thoughts and or memories that I don't even want to open up or think about because they're, they're so horrible. But living through them at the time, it filled my, my anger to, to be able to, to, to like defy him, you know? And ultimately escape and why I got to meet one of my best friends in the whole world, which is you and uh -huh. uh, be around your family, which is my family. Now, everyone doesn't believe that we're like families. And I'm like, no, it, I don't know how it happened. Uh, yeah. I don't know how it happened, but we were supposed to be together for some reason. And I thank God every day that you had the strength to run away that day. Now, mm -hmm. I can't imagine how you feel because I wanted to meet those nine children so badly that I'll never have a chance to meet. And you were robbed of knowing uh, your sisters, your cousins, and I can't imagine what that's like. You know, my, my younger sister, like I really was planning to get, to go back and get her. You know, I can't save everybody, but I knew we were inseparable. We spent every single day of our life together. Like we were, we never left each other's sight. So, you know, losing her was very hard on me. It was like, I lost a part of myself and the chance to not be able to go back and, and show her that there's life out there and there's so much happiness. You know, I just remember being such a happy person 
for everything that happened to me, it made me, instead of making me angry and bitter, it made me happy, happy that I can, like, it was like, the only thing I can compare it to was probably somebody who's been in jail for a lifetime and finally gets out and the, the warm sun is on their, their face and they, and they get to be free and walk out and do what they want. I remember just thinking, I don't have to ask to eat. I can actually go and eat whatever I want. I can eat, go buy a hamburger. I can wake up when I want. I, I, no one's going to hit me today. Like, I, I, I just can't even explain. Like, it's so like weird. And I wanted to get the chance to like show her that that we can actually walk outside. We can go play outside. We can walk to the store. We can, like every time I would pay for groceries, I would look at money in my hands and think, wow, I'm actually buying a candy. I'm actually walking down the street. Like it would take me hours and hours to even explain to anyone how every single thing, thing I did in life, like getting up, getting out of bed, I actually can turn on the shower instead of boiling water, putting it in a milk jug. Like everything about my life changed and I wanted to give, to get a chance to show her that, that there was actual happiness. We didn't have to feel sad every day and depressed and hopeless and, and, and angry. You always knew it was wrong, but that didn't change the fact that you knew what he was capable of and you were petrified yeah. of him. And I remember even on the stand, you weren't able to speak freely, right? You still had, you still had him in your ear and you were, he was in the room. I mean, he was scary. Like less than like 10 feet away. And to be honest, if, if we could, if we would redo the trial, things would be so different for everybody. Everybody has grown. Everybody knows what a monster and a monster is just not, is not even a, it doesn't even describe him. I, we, there needs to be a new word in a dictionary for a person like that but things would be so different like no one would be even trying to defend him or or everyone was still scared and everyone thought that actually he was gonna get out and if they spoke against him we're gonna be in trouble the climate in the fresno community at that time was crazy i mean Mm -hmm. I, I remember I was at the post-trial kind of wrap up for Scott Peterson when you were giving birth to little Alicia and your yeah. trial had just wrapped up. And I think the community was just so surrounded with all of these crazy things happening that they didn't know what to think. And it yeah. didn't turn out well for your family. I mean, let's be honest. It, it was it was tough. People gave you guys yeah, tough. really hard time. People would treat us like, like we were not victims. And that's horrible because we were the worst victims you could, that could ever exist. Like we were babies and grew up until we didn't have a choice. If we did have a choice, we, we wouldn't have chosen that life. And to be beaten and, and held back and, and the rest of our life were, were going to be damage we didn't choose that I think that's the thing where your mom came in you know I I try to explain to people that she was his first victim she had no voice in the house just like all of you she was in the same boat uh he didn't listen to your mom mm -mm. no 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 not at all sometimes she would be like a little voice of reason sometimes like to save us from like getting in trouble every once in a while, but no, he, he made sure that she didn't really have any power. I mean, she would step in if he was like going to kill somebody literally. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's about the only time she could stop him. Yeah. And she, she would try to step in that other times, but he, you know, he would disregard it. You know, it wasn't really an option for her. <laughs> the last thing I have to ask you is about yeah. the man who sits on formerly what was known as death row at San Quentin. Do you ever think about him mm -hmm. still? Do you think about the fact that he's still sitting there thinking about you guys? I would like him to know what he did because he hasn't realized what he did and the, the ramifications of of treating people that way, your children, the people you're supposed to love, 
he hasn't realized that and he's living in this false reality and I need him I want him to get snatched out of it and be set in front of the mirror and show this is what you did this is the the consequences of what you did this is actually who you are he believes that you guys are still his flock and that you still support him and fawn over him and adore him. And he's living in this world. Now, I have to believe sometimes reality creeps in, whether it be something someone says, hopefully, but he's not around Gen Pop. So he's not around no. other people who can, you know, sometimes things happen to child molesters mm -hmm. in prison, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He's more privileged than that. He's protected. Yeah. I didn't even want him to actually get the actual death penalty. I wanted him to just go to prison and be in general population and live a hellish life of what, how we thought every day. You're going to get beat every day. You're going to get raped. Okay. That's to, to be I honest, like, I'm, I'm being honest about it. I did not want him. I actually wrote a letter asking the judge to let him live. And right. I did that for a reason. I didn't do it because I was on his side. I did it because he didn't deserve to be separated and protected and, and have a little tiny room of himself with a TV and letters and, and um, three meals a day and get to walk around knowing no one's going to ever touch him. And candy bars. That. I remember that he was getting candy bars. And yeah. I don't know why that struck me so much, but I just was remembering how he starved you guys growing up. What you wouldn't have done for a candy bar when you were a kid, starving, literally starving, digging through the garbage when he allowed you to eat, asking mm -hmm. for every bite of food that you could eat. And he's sitting in prison eating candy bars. And I just don't get it it's or like the people fair. that actually like put money on his books like people that actually send him money like who can ever send him money like no one should ever nobody in the family no one should he he gets money he gets letters he gets visit he has like um people that actually visit him like there are certain people at certain times of the month that visit him like he has a consecutive list of people that he he has a a, a social life going on Okay, not only does he have a social life, but he got money from the federal government. He got oh, a yeah, stimulus, he got a yeah, stimulus he took, check. He took my mom's stimulus check. I, well, I'm still investigating whether that was fraud or not, but according to your mom, Marcus Wesson was able to claim her stimulus check mm -hmm. also. Yep. At San Quentin Prison on what's formerly called death row. I'm still yeah. investigating that right now. I have some calls out. I'm hoping it's not true, but when oh, she true. called, that's what they told her. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like I, I talked to them. Like it's actually true. He actually collected a stimulus set. He probably bought himself a plethora of candy bars. <laughs> I don't I know. think people know this. Marcus Wesson got a stimulus check. Marcus Wesson is is protected every hour of the day and he can do basically what he wants in there and live in his own little fantasy world mm -hmm. you guys never got that chance he's definitely living in his, in, in his own fantasy world and, and a lot of people do that and i know he does it because he created that around him and whenever he saw a glimpse of it he would freak out and i know there was a time where i gave him a glimpse of it and and he didn't like what he saw so it's like, I know, I know he's doing that because you, you have to do that and be able to cope with who you are and, and imagine being him. You're the worst person ever. I feel like that guilt would just instantly kill you. He always said somebody, someday somebody's going to kill me and I'm going mm -hmm. to be a martyr, but I'm going to come yeah. back and I'm going to, you know, be with yeah, you. Still. Exactly. So exactly. that would just play into it. But I, I firmly believe that he always knew someday he was going to get caught for all of his heinous crimes and that he would oh, yeah. be to death. And so he was just setting all of that up, setting the stage mm -hmm. for you guys to, to still be brainwashed. And thank God yeah. you guys all broke out of it. Time does heal a lot. And it's just how you deal with things and how you, and just acceptance as well. I had to accept that this, these were the cards that I was dealt with in life. And this is what what I had to deal with and either I'm going to just give up and fail and, and just let e everything go be because of my past or I'm going to move forward and be a better person and 
do everything I could do in my power to make make them proud. So, you know, to basically live for for the ones who didn't get get to live. <laughs>